Thank you. <laughs> cool. OK, so PureScript is a small new language it compiles to JavaScript. And it was written to compile to JavaScript. It's very Haskell inspired, mostly the type system. Uh, but one major difference from Haskell is that it's not lazy, which if you don't know what that means, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you do, it can catch you. Um, so there are a bunch of different languages in this space, and some of them include Haskell. So there's GHC, JS, uh, so you can take your Haskell and compile it to JavaScript. There are some smaller subsets, uh, like Haste, and I don't know, there's like five of them. But um, basically, they all include some form of a runtime. And so by uh, sacrificing the laziness and uh, specifically trying to compile to JavaScript that is both readable and debuggable. Uh, we've kind of skipped the needing a runtime. So you'll notice in a second when we look at the code that when you do a function in PureScript, you get a function in JavaScript. And when you say something is 5 in PureScript, you get a var whatever is 5 in JavaScript. So um, yeah, it's sort of like a more powerful way to write JavaScript rather than once you compile, you can't look, touch it anymore because it's scary. <laughs> and one other advantage to that is that it makes the FFI really powerful. Um, if you've used Flow or TypeScript, it will feel similar. Um, you're basically just telling the compiler, compiler to trust you for a little while, uh, and then you can write whatever JavaScript you want, uh, which can be actually kind of nice. Even though the, the type system is kind of daunting at first, it can be nice that if you do get completely stuck on something, you can just hand off to JavaScript for a couple seconds. And, um, cool. So let's get this installed. The easiest way is npm install uh, both PureScript and pulp. So PureScript is the compiler. Um, pulp is a build tool. And the convention in the community, community right now is mostly to use Bower. Um, so if you're pulling stuff in um, from JavaScript, you usually use npm. If you're pulling in PureScript dependencies, you usually use Bower. And it's because you actually pull down the source code. And when they started doing this, um, NPM3 wasn't out yet either. And so you, they wanted the flat dependency list that Bower gives you. So um, that might change. But if you use pulp, you probably won't notice. So um, pulp just wraps Bower. Uh, and it also does a bunch of other cool things. So we'll install that. Um, and I'll give you guys a couple seconds to do that. And then I'll show you how it works. If you want editor support, uh, it's a little more complicated right now. Uh, the easiest thing to do is with Atom, you can install these two Atom plugins. And then this is um, a Haskell thing. So if you have Stack, it's really easy to clone it and install it like this. Uh, if you don't have Stack, you can download the binary, or I don't know, we can talk about it later. Um, but yeah, that'll give you like uh, completion and everything like that. There are also Vim and Emacs plugins. Uh, I haven't used the Emacs one, but the Vim is just language syntax. So um, yeah. Uh, you can also get um, PureScript itself off of um, Brew, and it's usually a little more up to date, but they're both pretty good. And then Pulp you can only get on NPM. So once you're over here and you've got it installed, you'll have this PSC command. PSC is the compiler, and you probably won't use it much because Pulp does almost everything for you. Um, there's also PSCI, but you probably won't use that much either because Pulp will set it up for you. Um, so what we will do to start with is use Pulp to start our little scaffold of a project. So if we make a directory. And then we run pulp in it. It'll install some dependencies, just some default ones. And we'll see that we get a Bower JSON, Bower components, source, and test. Um, so let's look real quick at the Bower JSON. And I gotta find my window. 
I had to run hope in it and not just hope. Yeah, hope in it. Sorry. Yep. Oh. Cool. So it gives you this little main file, which just logs to the console. And it gives you a test file, which also logs to the console. Um, there's not really a... Um, I haven't yet seen any like big testing libraries. You pretty much just import a cert and throw an exception if it, something wasn't what you expected. So uh, it works pretty well. You can run the tests with uh, pulp test. Uh, and here, this actually ran. So we got tests okay at the bottom. But this part up here is a warning about us not annotating main with a type, um, which Actually, you don't do very often, but we'll come back to that later. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I want to do is uh, actually look at some of the code. So you'll see over here after the section on editor support, I've just got a bunch of code snippets. And none of these really do a whole lot, um, but it's just kind of like highlighting each feature. Um, so we'll just go through a couple of these and look at the JavaScript it creates, and it's pretty approachable. And um, also, people will have different levels of experience with uh, the syntax and the type system and um, maybe even JavaScript. So feel free to ask questions when we get to each of these. So over here, whenever you build, you get this output directory. And this took me a little while to figure out at first. Um, when you run a normal build, it takes everything in your source directory plus everything in your Bower components, <coughs> builds all of that, and puts it into output. And the stuff that you get in output is JavaScript in the format of CommonJS modules. So you'll notice here we're exporting main. Um, so we could take this directory, this output directory, and import stuff from here in pretty much any JavaScript program. So let's stick this on the side. And okay. So if we get rid of all this, the first example on that other page was just a number. And a number in PureScript <coughs> is just a number in JavaScript. So JavaScript has a number type in a very <coughs> loose sense. Um, so if we write it like this, you'll notice that we get an error because 5 is actually an int. You need to do 5.0. <laughs> and then we look over here on the compiled code, and we see we get pretty much exactly what we said. Uh, we get var x equals 5.0. Um, can anyone see this? Better. Um, and then you'll notice that it exported it. So everything at the top level is exported by default. If we come over here and we add uh, y equals 4, um, then we also get y over here. We get a little warning about not having annotated that type. But if up here we specifically say we're exporting x, then you'll notice the y disappears from over here. So that's going to be familiar for Haskell people, but um, that's how you can kind of control what's exported. So what if we don't have a number? What if we instead have an int? So now we can set it to 5. And over here it's just 5. But we'll see why the, the int affects it a little more in a second. So. So far, nothing special. It's just a 5. Um, but let's do add. And you'll notice here that in order to do add with the plus sign, we had to import it from this thing called prelude. It's not there by default like it is in Haskell. Um, this is like the, base, the basic types and the basic library for pretty much every program will use it. There's actually, because it's you have to explicitly import it. There are actually um, some different options. If you don't like this one, you can use a different one, which is kind of weird. But so far, this is the only one I've seen. What is the 
printed syntax around the plus? Ah, uh, yes. So, um, notice up here we're exporting x explicitly. Here we're importing plus explicitly. Um, and it's not just plus because um, this is a weird symbol. If we were importing add, we'd just do it like that. But whenever you're importing a symbol or an operator, it gets parentheses around it. Let's delete this. Putting parentheses around an operator, like in Haskell, is how you use uh, an infix operator as a prefix function or pass it to a, as a higher order function to another. Yep. Okay, so you're escaping it essentially. Yeah, so we could take this plus right here in our add and put it at the front. Um, but we needed to put parentheses around it to do that. Um, so sections in your script? Sections? Yeah, where you just or you like plus three. Oh, uh, we'll find out. Or, oh, right. Yeah, that works. Cool. Okay, so let's look for a second at the code that this generated. You notice over here, our add function is being set to a function that just takes x, and it returns another function that takes y, uh -huh. which makes sense. Um, so similar to Haskell, um, everything is queryable. So what this allows you to do is I can pass the add function into something and bind it to one number, and then like add three, and I have a function, add three and it takes one more thing that I want to add 3 to. Um, so that's the reason for that. Is everything queried by default? Yep. Everything is queried. Um, the only exceptions are there's a, I think it's pure script functions, I think. Um, there's a, a library that gives you a bunch of helpers. Um, it's like make function 2, make function 3, make function 4. Uh, and there's inverse also for taking um, a non curried JavaScript function and converting it to a curried one. Um, so those are helpful if you want to. Um, so I have a library that is written in PureScript and it takes two arguments, but I wanted to export one that just took two arguments because it's going to call it in JavaScript. So um, you just put the make function two right in front of it and it wraps it in a special function. Um, so, real quick, let's change this to int and compile again. And you'll notice one tiny little thing changed. This is the binary or operator. Yep. So every operation that we do with ints will get this binary uh, or zero, which just truncates it, so we get ints. <laughs> so now you don't have to worry about the point zero 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 three. Um, what you can do in JavaScript is just really obnoxious. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it, so that makes it safe to do integer math. Yeah, there might be some limitations, but as far as I know, it's as safe as you can get in JavaScript. Because you'll, pre you'll pretty much like if we do. Let's real quick add another uh, parameter here. Uh, so if we also add, oops, z. You notice that it truncates it and then truncates it again. So you will still have the weird uh, floating point math in there, but it should get uh, trimmed off pretty before anything weird can happen. Um, so yeah. Um, are there source maps that are generated also? Uh, I think you can, yes. Okay. I forget if it's by default. Um, but generally the code's been readable enough that I haven't worried about it because I wouldn't have any idea how I'd step through that function. Yeah. Um, and actually, like, I've been learning Haskell, but I found it easier to learn the same ideas here because it's easier to figure out what's happening underneath. You just open up the JavaScript. So it's not exactly the same because it's not lazy, but still. Um, and actually, because... Um, the basic types like plus and or or and and or and stuff like that um, 
they're implemented in terms of the foreign function interface. So an and, if you do and and, it's going to be a JavaScript and and. And so in that sense, the second half is lazy just because that's how JavaScript works. So, yeah. Um, OK, next thing, basic data types. So here we've got the familiar maybe, maybe. So if we compile this, we'll notice we got a little more code than probably expected. But if we look at it for a second, uh, it makes a lot of sense. So you'll notice the first type here was nothing. And it's a type constructor. So over here, we get a nothing. And it's built with a function called nothing. And because this one doesn't have any value to hold, um, it just gets set to this static value property. And everywhere that your <coughs> script tries to refer to this thing, it's going to look like this. So uh, this stuff is really useful to look at if you're going to write some JavaScript in the FFI stuff, and you're not sure how to turn it back into something that your script knows how to deal with. Because if it's supposed to return a maybe, then you need to return a maybe. Um, but it turns out you can just import it with CommonJS and construct a new one, so a new maybe. So did you just make? This is a data type that you define brand new called maybe. Yep, um, and it would conflict uh, with the default library, except that I don't have the import prelude anymore. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we're pretty much starting from scratch right here. Um, so you'll notice that the only things that were exported were nothing and maybe, because at runtime, uh, this doesn't mean anything. This maybe mm -hmm. over here. Um, it's all compile time stuff. So. so now we have constructors that are called both nothing and maybe, right? Yep. And maybe is parameterized. Oh, wait, no. That's my bad. This should be uh, just. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Made that really confusing. Um, yeah, so there's no maybe over here. There's just just and nothing. OK. There's just just. <laughs> there's just nothing. <laughs> Um, so if we use those a little bit and see what the code that calls them looks like. Um, we still have the same stuff up here. But now down here we've got our two functions. And actually they're not functions um, because they're not from something to something else. They're just values. So greeting is basically a constant with this maybe string inside. And we can see over here, they're not in the same order, but um, greeting over here is just passing in to the constructor. And here we just use the value. OK. So yeah. is it OK if you go back over really quickly why nothing has a value attribute that's static? Um, my guess is that because it doesn't have a parameter, it, it never changes. Oh. Like a just A and a just B would be different, but Nothing's always nothing. Um, and it doesn't have to worry about uh, different types because um, the maybe A doesn't mean anything at runtime. It's all compile time. So it's probably, I don't know. Okay. It's probably just performance. And in this case, is dot value always just going to be undefined? This one? Yeah. Uh, it'll be the oh, new, it new nothing. So it, oh, okay. it creates an object of the nothing class, and it's just, just that constant for everything. Yeah, that makes sense. How does equality work? Like, if you were to test to see if two just hellos are equal to each other. Yeah, let's see. That's a great question. William, I don't even know if this will compile, but. Nothing will probably work. Oops. Nothing will probably equal nothing, but I want to see how like, just hello equals just hello. Oh, I gotta import it. <coughs> oh. Did that work? Two, two. Is there two or one? We only have one equal in here. Oh, sorry. Thanks. He's just trying to decide twice. <laughs> so there's no implementation of the type class eek. So we can't oh, okay. see if maybe's are equal, uh, but we could implement it. 
Uh, so we could say this kind of skipping it a little bit, but um, so you have to give the class. Oh wait, sorry, this is wrong. Instance. You have to give them names, um, and I think it's something to do with the JavaScript side of things, being able to refer to it in a way that makes sense. Um, so that's one difference from Haskell, but. Oops. Do I have to specify which movie this is? Yeah. One sec, I think. Yeah, I don't know. We'll figure it out when you guys are working on the project. Okay. Um, but I do have some other type class stuff here, so we can look at that. Um, so let's look real quick. Uh, we just looked at data, so now we look at type. Um, and so Elm does these a little differently. It, it kind of redefines what some of these mean. I think type is more like data. Um, but this is going to be more like Haskell, where type is an alias, and data is the one that makes a constructor. Um, did that compile? OK. Um, so we didn't actually create any of these things, so there's nothing at runtime. They're just type definitions. Um, and they're type definitions for the shape of a record. So on the right side here, you've got this user shape. And it has a name field and a string and an email field and a string. Um, but there's no constructors. It's just an alias for an object that looks like this. And it will actually be an object in JavaScript with two properties. Um, one cool thing uh, about PureScript is there are two extensible types. Um, so records are extensible. So here we can say that this is this looks like a user. I just made up this name. Um, but you can pass in some extra stuff. And so this user thing is just requiring that it has a name and email field, but it could have anything else that the caller wants to specify. So it's still going to be strongly typed at the end because the caller has to specify what extra fields are allowed in there, but um, we don't have to restrict it up front. Uh, I think I have an example with a value, maybe? No? OK. OK. So here, things are a little, little bit more confusing. Um, now we're importing more stuff. And they're just the common JS imports. Um, so we'll come back to this again later. Um, but the effect uh, type is PureScript's version of IO, basically. Um, so it's a monad, and it's you can use do notation inside it. Like down here, we can say do. Say hi. Um, oops. Um, but the difference between IO and this effect type is that for one, it takes not just, let's see at the end here, it's unit. So this is an effect that returns a unit, which is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and it also specifies that it has this side effect. And this is determined by the fact that we're using log here. And so the type of log is pretty much this exact same thing, um, except that it takes a string. So again, we see here this extensible system. So I can say this function here for any, any variable effect, this function adds the effect of logging to the console, plus whatever else was already going on. So what this means is that if I have this thing that logs to the console, and below it I have something that touches the DOM, and I call both in main, then um, 
my main function will have type um, effect console comma dom, okay. um, which is why main gets hard to annotate because it tends to grow <laughs> as you do more things with your program. But one thing that's cool is that you can just put this filler thing in here. And this one's a little bit hard to read, but you can also say, well, I know it's going to be f something and something. So um, then down here we can see what the invert type was. It's kind of hard to read a lot of the time. So if you run it in the console, you get more stuff. Um, so basically, it made up a different name for this, but it's still a console effect. Okay, so let's look real quick at one more thing. So here, I imported tuple, and I forgot to put that on the, the gist. Um, but it says it doesn't have it, and it's just because I haven't installed that library. So now we can see this pulp thing real quick. So um, everything, yeah, let's look at this for a second, actually. Um, these are all the commands here. So we already used init and we look to test really fast. Uh, build builds the project and puts it into output in the common JS format. Um, Browserify makes a bundle, but it's of everything that's in the output thing. Um, and I'm not sure, I might have an optimized setting or something. But if you use build and then two, um, let me come back to that once we can build. Um, so if you build then two, you can output all of your code to one JavaScript file and it removes all the unused code. So you might import 20 modules and only use one function from each, but it's only going to give you the stuff that you used. Um, so that's one thing that's cool compared to regular common JS. Um, so this uh, depth command here, everything you do after depth is just shelled out to Bower. So, uh, we can say I, just like you can in Bower, and we can save. And all the libraries by convention are um, prefaced with PureScript dash. And at some point, that might go away, and there'll be like a specific, <coughs> like Pulp will know whether you're installing a PureScript thing or a non-PureScript thing, and then just add that for you. But for now, you always type it. Okay. So that was your script tuples. And then if we build again, it should work. OK, so this will look familiar. Uh, we did this with maybe, but this one doesn't have any values to store. Um, so it's more like an enum. And then below that, we define this class. And if you're not sure what the class is yet, um, don't worry about it. We can come back to it later. But Basically, this is the one thing that makes the output more confusing than you would expect, but it's actually not too bad. So down here, we've got this mirror function. And our definition of mirror takes one thing. It takes this a, and it returns a tuple. And over here, we've got one parameter, a, and we return a tuple. But if we look at the code that was generated, we've actually got one more wrapper here. So here's our A. We've also got this dictionary of reversible stuff. So this is one thing from the type system that does make it into the runtime, because it has to know which version of reverse to call when it's running. So when this is compiled over here, it takes this restriction and makes it the first parameter to your function. So this can be the one thing that is really hard to deal with when you're in JavaScript trying to call something in PureScript. Um, you generally want to like 
make a little wrapper library that does this work for you so you don't see it from the outside. Um, so over here we get this dictionary and we have our A and instead of, so we turn a new tuple, but instead of simply calling reverse on A, so here we've got our first parameter and our first parameter and here we call reverse but reverse also has this extra first parameter and it's the dictionary of implementations to use and then the actual A. So if we look over here at reverse, reverse takes this dictionary and it pulls out the reverse function because this could have um, a bunch of different functions on it if this had more stuff. If that makes sense. Um, one more thing that's new in here is we see how the pattern matching works. So right here, we have a version of reverse, one for each possible value. And what that becomes is these if statements that check the type of the instance, and then if it's not found, it'll blow up. So the compiler will actually tell you if you don't exhaust these things, which is nice. Um, so if you forget one, it warns you. But if you do somehow get into like actual running code um, and you fall through a case, it won't just like destroy the rest of your program. Um, cool. Any questions? <laughs> um, Let's do one thing really quick. I'm going to take this and put it up here. And comment that out. And put this here. And then comment this out. Because uh, I don't. I don't have a good feel for like how many people have any idea what class is. Can you ask it too? Yeah. Well, what, is, sorry. what class is? Like if you're familiar with the Haskell stuff already or not. Okay. Okay. So class, um, if you're more familiar with OOP stuff, is sort of like an interface. Um, so here we've got this function and this compiles. And so this up here, sort of like an enum or constructors, it's just some values that we can use um, and they're type safe. So this would be pretty much the same as saying like var north equals new object, etc. Um, so unique values for each thing except that they're type checked. And then down here we've got a function and the pattern matching here says we could take this as a, an argument and then in here we could do like if it's north do this, if it's south do this. Um, but a faster way to write it in the Haskell like languages is to pattern match. So we write the function four times and this one only gets called if the parameter was north. So yeah. Um, and if we look at the implementation real quick, we've got a reverse function, and it's got the same pattern matching we saw a second ago. We have a mirror, and it just takes one argument. It doesn't take the type as an argument, and it just calls reverse. It doesn't pass in the dictionary of possibilities. OK, so the difference is um, if we had two things that were reversible, not just this direction, but we wanted to also reverse strings or something, then what we can do is we basically take this function here and we split it so that we have the definition of the function, its signature here, and the implementation down here. Okay, so <coughs> class will be sort of like an interface. Um, so this class of reversible things, and we don't care what the reversible thing is yet, that's the thing that we're abstracting over. 
And then instead of specifically saying direction, we're going to say this A type, whatever it is. And we have no implementation. That's it. So right now, this thing's pretty useless. Um, but the pair of class is instance. And so we can take any type. In this case, we're going to take the direction type. So reversible direction. Oops. And we specify which class we're implementing and which specific type um, we're implementing it for. So you notice these lines look kind of similar. And then here, where a normal function you'd say this is the signature and this is the implementation. We don't specify the signature because it's already up here. We just specify the implementation. But then also we could do the same thing for a different type. Uh, so rev string And then we do whatever, and we we could call into JavaScript. Actually, let's do that real quick. We'll call JavaScript. So right here, if you want to call into JavaScript, you use the foreign keyword and import. So we're going to import the foreign function from JavaScript, and we'll call this uh, string reverse. And all we do here is specify the type. So the type is string, string, OK? And now that we have a string to string, we can use that here. It's not part of the form function interface. It's just lets us use it. Um, is that wrong? Oh. OK, so now the only error is that it couldn't find, um, wait. Oh, sorry, this error is not relevant. Not yet. OK. So the trick for the form function interface is if we go back over here to our source code, we've got a main dot pure script, and then we put right next to it a new file called main.js. So they go together. And then we also have to specify which module it is. So over here at the top, um, it's module main. So over here, we say main. OK. And then kind of like over here, it's just common.js. We say exports, same name, string reverse equals function. And then we can do whatever we want here. And I think string.reverse is a thing. Is it? JavaScript yeah. people? Oh, yeah, it's it turns it into an array though. Uh, split and then join. Ah, uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. And you have to put an empty string in join because otherwise it separates them by columns. Is it? Awesome. I think so. Uh, or spaces or something. Well, this is why we're in PureScript. <laughs> OK. Um, and it probably actually be easier to write that in PureScript than JavaScript, but that works as an example. OK, so now I think the complaint is that we aren't using our import or something. Um, so let's uncomment this again. And sometimes I don't trust Adam. Oh, I forgot something. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> so now we can use this pulp PSCI. And the difference between pulp PSCI and regular PSCI, if we just run that on the command line, uh, is that pulp pulls in all of the stuff in Bower components um, and source and makes it available for importing. So now we can import main. And we should be able to call reverse. Actually, let's check the type of reverse. 
Okay. Um, we should be able to call reverse for some string. And it works. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so next I just had I started building a project, but it got too complicated for the the time limit. And if you wanna see that what I have so far we can look at it, but the stuff that gets really complicated is I either have this one massive file for all of the state or like the whole view is in one function um, or I have to figure out how the types for parent components work. And I haven't figured that out yet. Um, so yeah. But if you've got access to this and this is out of date, yeah. There's this tic-tac-toe part one and part two and we can either talk about the stuff we've already done or work on these things or work on them together or whatever. Um, but then um, part two kind of rewrites part of part one and this is a complete version of both um, that I changed it just a tiny bit because it had compiler warnings. Um, but yeah, so that's it. Cool. Um, the last thing I want to plug real quick is, and this might be helpful while you're hacking away, um, there's the PureScript by Example book by Phil Freeman. He's the author of PureScript, so he knows what he's talking about. And uh, it's actually really good. It starts from uh, pretty basic stuff, especially if you aren't familiar with this kind of language. Um, he doesn't explain quite as well as the book at the bottom in terms of like general FP concepts. Um, and some of the type class stuff and the abstract math stuff. Um, so if you're interested all in that, this book at the bottom is really good for that. If you're interested in PureScript, this one's awesome because it works through tons of examples and it, there's like a repository of code that goes with it and um, it keeps it up to date. There's also an IRC channel which is very active and um, Phil and a bunch of other people that work on the core libraries are all there all the time. So they've been really helpful. And pursue it is really cool. Um, if you've used Google, it's like that. Um, but it's got a list of all the known packages. And you can just send a pull request to add a package to it, I think. Um, but if we look for React, there's this PureScript React wrapper, which is what the tic-tac-toe thing uses. And so those will be the docs. And oh, one more cool thing about pulp that I forgot to show you before. Um, you know, notice here, it's got this docs command. If you put strings above your functions, um, pulp will generate these uh, markdown style docs with like example code and stuff. So it's cool. Um, but that's how pretty much all the docs are generated. Um, so we get this React MD, and you can tell when they didn't add any text because it, it'll just say like, this will be it. <laughs> but it still is helpful because um, the types help a lot in figuring out what's going on. Yep. Is there deriving? Can you let derive show derive? Uh, yes, sort of. Um, I think some of that's changing right now. The latest release changed some of it, but I don't know enough about it to be able to explain it. There is a prescript um, generic Uh, for in, uh, generics. If you import this thing, it adds some like runtime stuff, so you can like generate um, show and stuff like that. Generate. I don't know if it does equality or. But yeah. Anyway, some of that stuff is there. It's not quite as polished as Haskell, but it's getting there. Um, and he said that he's really close to um, having a version of this which is compatible with ASON, the parsing library in Haskell. So we theoretically would just write one type on each side and then they'd be able to talk to each other. So that'd be cool. Um, so yeah, I would say as of right this second, um, just for doing front end stuff, Elm is probably more friendly. Um, and they're both really interesting right now. Elm has some really nice compiler help and the type system is simpler so it's easier to get started. 
But um, as soon as you start reading the Haskell book and learning about some of the abstractions, it is really hard to let them go <laughs> and stay in them. Um, and then the other cool thing is that because you get one-to-one, -one, like your prescript code exactly becomes JavaScript code. It's just a matter of figuring out the types. Um, so you can do anything. So we've got a little client-side script for um, sending some analytics data up to our server. Uh, I can actually show you real quick. Um, this guy. This is our flagship pure script thing. Um, and this uses the afjax library, which builds on this af monad. So af is a lot like effect, except that it's asynchronous. So it's basically like promises. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you'll notice down here, um, this one returns an f, but we lift it into f so we get the location. Um, and it could change every time the URL changes, so it can't just be a static string. And then um, the actual, we would make a request down here and send it. And yeah, so this part right here um, is synchronous because the thing in here is an effect that gets lifted into F. But this line here is would be asynchronous if there was one more line after it. <laughs> If we did something with the response, then it would be asynchronous. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that's about it. And so far, we're not really taking huge advantage of the type system, because we just take an object and turn it into JSON and send it to the server. Um, but it's nice that it's there when we do want it. I and mean, if we do end up calling that code from other pure script stuff instead of just from JavaScript, then we get the advantages of the type system. And the other thing that's cool is that with this really strong type system, it didn't affect the runtime stuff hardly at all. I mean, it's a little bit bigger than if I just typed, uh, you know, make a new uh, XHR request and send it, but not a whole lot more. It's like four kilobytes or something, which you probably have a bigger dependency if you pulled in any of the main like JavaScript uh, Ajax libraries. So, yeah, cool. Well, I'll let you guys work on that stuff, and feel free to ask me questions. So I can reverse a string, but reversing south is not working. So, let's see. So oh, okay. So that's a, a good thing to point out. Um, the error there isn't that you couldn't reverse the direction. The error is that once the direction was reversed, it didn't know how to tell you which direction was reversed. So this error mm -hmm. here is saying there's no instance for show. Oh, it doesn't know how to show. Direction. Okay. Yeah. Um, which, unfortunately, is hard to have it just infer for you, but. Um, because we're back yeah. to the deriving. Yep. Um, so yeah, you pretty much just do the same thing for show, and this side would be in quotes instead of <laughs> reversing. Can do that real quick.
getting the e9 on uh, server.